Hello, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us at Lodge Register with James Reed and myself, Tiang Long, in a interesting topic about achieve the perfect turnaround for today. Just for your information, throughout the course of this presentation, you will be able to ask your questions by asking them through the questions button on the right of your screen. And in the interest of time, you should be aware that throughout this time, we will be recording a session which will be shared with yourself and others at a later time. As just for information, um, as you have not aware that Lloyd Register is a company with more than 250 years heritage of history. We have worked with more than 60,000 clients, as well as various offices dotted around the world. Through industry collaboration, we continue to drive and advance the knowledge in technology and solutions to promote safety and security in an increasingly complex world. We have various capability to support the evolving energy landscape from the reservoir to refinery and beyond. And today we'll be speaking to you to about achieving the perfect turnaround. As you have known that managing a turnaround is a complex challenge. There are many individual activities and their respective resources that need to be coordinated in a, such a way that the overall duration of the plant downtime is minimized as much as possible. So the plant can be started up and returning to operations safely and reliably. So effective planning and execution is the key to deliver an excellent turnaround program. As you can see here, we look at our turnaround program excellence by forming into the three main pillars. Here's some of the key elements about achieving a perfect turnaround. As I mentioned earlier, planning and preparation is important to define a consistent scopes control as well as having a standardized work plan. The definition as well as the fit and tolerance and level of quality and quantity has to be bang on and spot on. The overall event optimization would normally take place by adopting an integrated team approach. We're going to swiftly move on to the execution phase. As we know, established performance indicators are important in tracking the schedule attainment as well as the status reporting throughout the turnaround event. And I have to say this, the strict scopes management is really fundamental in managing any unexpected event or emerging work. It's without saying that communication through coordination as well as controlling of various key drivers it's really, really important to ensure the workforce really understand the expectation of results as well as what the success looks like towards the end of the turnaround. I would also like to add that throughout the turnaround, before we started the planning process and execution, there should be a good governance as well as risk management process. Everyone who are involved from our own personnel as well as third party contactor should understood the standardized methods as well as the processes across different activities, be it milestones, as well as how they are being successful, being selected in the process, or even how we need to substitute them. It's without saying that defined roles and responsibility is the fundamental of good governance and coordination during the turnaround event. In the event of any turnaround, the risk management plan is also needs to be highly visible so that everyone is aware about critical path as well as the reporting process. Now, I know that I've been talking various things about how to achieve a perfect turnaround at this point, but there has been a much more bigger challenges that we have been seeing so far attributed to the low oil prices as well as the coronavirus pandemic. Now, I think that I would want to say is that we're going to launch a poll at the moment and trying to understand that how the low oil price crisis as well as the coronavirus has going to be affect your turnaround activity.
and you have roughly about a minute to answer them, I would encourage you to actually let us know and share with us that if this latest event actually going to change any turnaround activity with your company or your client. Yes, we start to see responding coming along. We can see that there are some of the response has been that, well, there's no turnaround being planned for current time, round about 60% and others round about 25 that speak about that there need to be major changes and around about 10% says my TAR will be canceled in its entirety. Yes, that's fundamentally is reflecting the whole situation that where we are with that. And we got this result and we will share it in the later time just to, for awareness of all the attendees today. So as any of, of you have shared with us, the COVID-19 effect has changed many aspects of the asset management as well as the in the long term as well as the short term period, we need to approach it with a bit more holistically with new focus on reducing costs without compromising safety and reliability. In the current climate, we need to think about our operating strategies as well as how we are going to maintain them. Um, as you would understand that if there has been a reduced demand, we might need to start to mount for some of our equipment as well as looking at decommissioning some of the plant. As such, rethink and review our major shutdown and turnaround events are really important. As I mentioned earlier, some of our clients have started to share with us that there has been a negative impact on inspection and maintenance backlogs, which is attributed to various factors from resources and materials that have a longer lead time. At this point, I would like to actually hand it over to my colleague, James, who would like to speak to you more about how Lloyd's Register could help you in managing the maintenance backlog in a robust and safe manner. I'm just going to hand it over to you, James. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to take you through um, maintenance backlog. So I'm going to start with what is backlog? You know, it, it sounds like a simple question, but it has it has different meanings between operators. And even within operators, there, there may be different interpretations uh, in different departments or in different uh, seniority levels. Uh, sometimes the definition of backlog is, is one which gives the smaller number. And um, typically that's what people will, will try and do to, to make it seem better than it, than it might be. But let's start at looking at what any backlog means to our business and what we should do about it. Backlog management should consider and count the following types of tasks. Safety critical inspections, safety critical assurance tasks, safety critical defects, planned maintenance of safety critical equipment, planned maintenance on non-safety critical equipment and non-safety critical defects. We, we should you know, define backlog uh, and it should be very simple uh, and defined as any task it's due it's past its due date as generated by the CMS or any task not completed with a specific period after the due date. I think the latter is very common uh, where the specific period sometimes called the compliance band is dependent on the task maintenance interval or on the task criticality uh, safety critical equipment for example. Before I move on to the next slide, I just want to share with you the results of a poll which were from a previous uh, webinar in this series that were, when asked about backlog. Um, so the participants in, in that webinar, um, about just under 15% stated they had no backlog 
just under 50% stated it was manageable. Uh, and then uh, you know, 36% and a small amount said it was completely out of control, but 36% said it was increasing. Um, and, and, and that was answered you know, with, the, with the specific consideration of the, the COVID-19 situation. Okay, I'll now take you through the dangers of backlog. Um, and, and basically risk lurks within backlog. And efficient backlog management with good quality data will give the operator the ability to quantify that risk and effectively manage it. Of course, keeping the backlog to a minimum is a good start. However, this is never easy and given the current situation even harder. And when there is no clarity about what the definition of backlog is, what the tasks are included, the significance of an overdue item, et cetera, it makes it difficult for manage, management to quantify the risk that is posed. The risk posed by the backlog is continually changing and if nothing else, it will increase with time alone. Corrective work orders for incipient faults will, if left without attention, result in eventual equipment failure. Many systems and uh, equipment can be single fault tolerant and can behave unpredictably when a subsequent fault arises. You know, for example, in, in a battery system, um, you can get multiple in, independent failures on duty standby systems. This is another example where, unless you can see or be or, or aware of the big picture, each defect may appear in itself low criticality, but in actual fact, the whole duty standby arrangement is compromised. Even with numerous non-safety critical defects in the backlog, it may get to the point where it is difficult to understand the cumulative effects and how equipment would perform in an actual, in an actual major accident hazard. Although safety is of prime concern, there is also risks to production that need to be understood, quantified and managed in the same way. Imagine, of, imagine the protective barriers as a series of brick walls. What backlog does is weaken the mortar. The wall will look like it is there, but it has, it has lost significant strength and integrity. Okay, moving on to some of the causes for backlog. Um, of course, there's there's uh, many reasons for backlog and, and some are, are, are more easier to resolve than others. So there's, you know, the maintenance burden, a lot of these issues go back to the actual maintenance schedule and that fact that you're probably over maintaining. Um, I think we, we ran a, one of the one of the webinars we ran that you guys, that everyone in this in this webinar might have attended was on maintenance optimization, uh, which went into into how how you can reduce your your maintenance or optimize your maintenance. But if at best maintenance intervals were based on calculated, based on uh, equipment reliability, when the plant was new, then it would have been derived from manufacturer's data, which is normally very conservative. At worst, the maintenance intervals were derived qualitatively or from generic maintenance strategies. Activities and intervals were maybe set up following manufacturer's recommendations to meet the, the warranty requirements, of, of which there, there is no warranty anymore. All of these scenarios generally lead to over maintenance, something which is never really addressed. I mean, there's there's other there's other issues as well which cause backlog. You know, competition for bed space between maintenance and other activities, poor maintenance planning, the CMS schedule not being properly smoothed. So you might have lots of lots of one type of work um, early in the year and none later on. Um, equipment unreliability, manpower or skill shortages, it could be lack of spare parts, um, which could be even more prevalent in, in today's situation they, with the um, supply chain uh, being more difficult. And all of these causes lead to backlogs that are never addressed because we spent all our time tackling the symptoms. So how should we manage our backlog? So how good are, you, uh, how good are your work management processes? Uh, you know, how, how should how should we how should we be we managing the backlog? This is not really a difficult concept. It's all about having a system which is comprehensive, accurate, and visible. Uh, comprehensive in, in that it covers all the activity types that matter. Accurate in that it displays backlogs in terms of task criticality. For example, safety critical, non-safety critical, time overdue, deferral viability, valid, validity, grouped by safety critical element or performance standard. And, and visible in that it's the whole picture and illustrated in a form relative to the audience. I think I mentioned before that, that you know, senior management or, or maintenance managers or maintenance supervisors may see a uh, backlog in a, in, in a different way and need to know different levels of detail as well. So you know, that visibility, it's important that it is tailored for the audience. 
document the process. So, you know, backlog management is a, a subject in itself which warrants its own process and procedure. This is important um, to ensure that backlogs are understood and that the risk is managed and, and that audit trail is maintained. You need to ensure the tasks are categorised in CMS so that we can understand the significance. And I'll go into that uh, in, in the next slide. Um, design and create dashboards. So dashboards showing total numbers, performance trends, dashboards showing backlog by department can sometimes have a positive effect, increasing motivation by promoting performance rivalry. Continual review, you know, there needs to be a continual review process and updating of priorities. The reviews need to involve the right people, such as uh, technical authorities or uh, responsible persons. Where a good functional hierarchy exists, it helps spot interactions between equipments with backlog work, being able to spot multiple failures associated with a system or package. Not all items of equipment will be classed as safety critical on a safety critical system but a functional hierarchy help identify if a defective item is possibly associated with a safety critical major component or system. Shift your goalposts, so set your measurement period as the due date. The compliance band is taken for granted far too often. It is only your insurance policy to award you flexibility so you can have two KPIs, a tactical KPI based on due dates and a KPI based on compliance. By focusing on the tactical KPI brings you the, into the low risk zone get driving in the centre of the lane and not continually with your wheels on the white line. Quite often, companies rally their people and get them motivated to go fight the backlog. It's easy to go for the easy hits and get the numbers down and be proud of the fact that backlogs are decreasing, but it's not like that. We have to approach the problem in an organised and calculated way and identify the task which expose the operation to, to the most risk and that may not be the oldest nor simplest task. It might be slower to get numbers down, but the numbers are secondary as long as the risk reduces. Senior management must take an active role in backlog management. The topic should be raised daily in operations meetings and kept high on the agenda and not something that only becomes topical during audits. Senior management must set targets for short and long term and provide the support in terms of resources to make it happen. The efforts don't stop when the backlog reaches an unacceptable level. It must be kept under control and be and and by this stage things are a lot easier. Okay, um, so how good are your, your work management processes? The work orders for maintenance, test and repair when analysed can tell us a lot about failure of equipment. Of course they do. You know, we all know that, don't we? When they can, of, if the closeout data entry is up to scratch, but they can tell us more. The first thing we think of when talking about analysing closed work orders is equipment failure. But we can also use the same work order history to analyse why our work management processes are failing. All CMSs allow us to allocate work order status codes. I think it's just sometimes that you know operators choose not to use the full the full. Um, functionality of the CMS. So you could you could you could allocate work orders as, as seen on the on the screen, you know, awaiting scheduling, awaiting permits, awaiting parts, ready to be done, awaiting shutdown, awaiting resource, work in progress, awaiting test. Anyway, these are these are just examples. Um, but as as a work order progresses through the generation, planning, scheduling, execution cycle, status codes like these above should be used and, and changed appropriately. What that can allow us to do is examine the reasons for the task going into backlog. For examples, if work orders go past their due date and still have a status of awaiting scheduling, it probably means that the work has not been planned. If it is past its due date and the status is awaiting parts, it, it probably means that the parts have not arrived on time, and that can be for a number of reasons. But then you know exactly where the further investigation needs to take place. The analysis itself may be complex, taking into account when status has changed and the order in which they appear, but the data is there to be used to improve. Now, finally, I'll just leave you with, you know, is there such a thing as a healthy backlog? You know, ideally, there should be no backlog, but in reality, there always will be. And manpower is a significant cost, especially on offshore installations. So if you have no backlog, this may suggest that you're, you're underutilizing your labor. So, in, in fact, a, a small backlog might actually be, be healthy in that situation. However, the target for safety critical backlogs should always be zero. So, I'll, I'll, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the, um, the results from the, the poll from that uh, Tiang put up on the screen earlier.
I hope you can all see that. Um, so although 60% have said I'm fine as I had no tar planned, um, and I think it's, it's, it's worth noting, um, it's worth noting that that's probably 75% you know, of these with a tar this year are um, going to see either see major changes or, or a cancellation. So I think that that's the kind of important part from from the, these results here. And I will now bring in a, a second poll, um, and this links on to what our next webinar will be. Um, so I'll give that a launch there. Uh, and this, this relates to what percentage of your maintenance strategy plans follow the original equipment manufacturer or the, the OEM um, prescription. Um, so you guys can, I'll leave this open for about another, another 30 seconds or so. So if you guys can uh, vote on this poll. Okay, starting to get some um, some responses in now. Okay, I'll, I'll give about another fifteen to twenty seconds for this poll, then I, I will close this and then hand back over to Tiang to continue. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you again, James. Thank you for sharing with us all about how we're trying to maintain as far as manage the maintenance backlog. I suppose as we have seen some of the poll results about there will be effect and impact on the turnaround activities. Um, here, we just going to share some of our ideas and as well as our experience uh, how we try to minimize our turnaround activities during this uh, unprecedented COVID-19 situation. I think first of all I would suggest that let's just evaluate all the statutory and legal compliance works and jobs and then where possible responsibly defer them to the maximum limits for safety and environmental reasons. For example in the UK if you have been working to a coma site, you might have some kind of a limitation whereby some critical non-destructive testing has a maximum limit of up to five years. And we have some experience whereby we know that some of the sites for onshore, they might have a four year cycle for turnaround cycle. And sometimes they have decided to optimize their turnaround activities and they have moved these activity forward I think these are the types of jobs that has an opportunity for us to defer them safely without actually affecting our compliance for safety and environmental laws. Obviously, we would also say that we should consider our turnaround strategy, whereby we, if we have historically having a major one, perhaps this is a time whereby we could have a smaller series of them because there have been a reduced demand for productions as well as the market because we know from our experience for offshore at least there are now certainly a restriction for manning resource level because of the POB for observing the social distancing and so on in the UK. Next I would have said that we should actually look into prioritizing the cost reduction work packages in the turnaround event. For example, if you have been always need to have a power generation using a certain level of diesel or fuel to power it, if you have got some medium term saving or you could reduce the direct cost because of the unreliability of these equipment, you should invest and make sure that is still happening in this smaller turnaround event. And last but not least, remember that this is an unprecedented event. And I know that any smart organization 
would try to retain their best people to remain on the business because we wanted to avoid the so-called corporate amnesia and as well as reduce the dependence of any contract laborers and specialists when the in the situation whereby we cannot mobilize them across different country or geogra geographical location during the lockdown situation. We believe this virus is here to stay. It may be take many, many more months before any vaccine and resolution will come to a more clearer conclusion that helps everyone back to a new normal. Now, obviously during this webinar we also promised you we're going to talk a bit more about anomaly management and as i would see it anomaly management it's actually just an, as important as it's the inspection backlog started to build up i guess without saying that many of you should um, have the appreciation that the anomalies management is primarily focusing on the repair monitor temporary repair as well as where possible performing fitness for service to extend the life of the component. And here's it's just a, one of a case study that we just quickly going to share with you where LR has been involved. So it's just a very simple case study whereby we've been working with one of our clients in trying to extend the life of the defined life repair. As you can see here, it's just an engineer composite wraps. I believe it's now started to be widely being used in many, many different geographical locations and operators as a measure to repair and just maintain the integrity of the component for a specific time period. During this time, we have been trying to help the client in actually evaluating different techniques, which is considered novel at the time when we're doing this in trying to establish the remaining wall thickness behind the engineer wrap. I think at the time we were actually exploring digital radiography as far as pulse eddy current. So the outcome has been very positive for this client. We have engaged with the NDD company and done some blind trials as far as validated some of the results, which is giving us confidence about the remaining wall thickness of the substrate as well as in Lloyd's capacity, we help the client to select the right NDT techniques. And with that, we have managed to extend the defined life of the original engine repairs, which may have had a defined life based on the procedure of around 24 months. We have successfully removed about five of the temporary repairs and reduced roughly about two days of work in the turnaround scope of work. I think in the end, I think it's a quite a positive outcome that even though that in the current climate, two days adds up and it helps the client to free up resources for other work. And I think that that's actually going to slowly draw into the conclusion of our presentation here today. I would say is that um, I, we will be starting to open uh, questions and answer sessions for all the attendees attending there. So um, please feel free to ask the questions and my colleagues will be helping us to um, look into um, different questions. Thanks, Tiang. We, we do have a few questions already um, to, give, to give you a, a break from from talking, I'll take one that's uh, directed at um, at the the backlog. So we've, we've got a question: What are your suggestions to identify and document critical backlog in in CMS? So I mean, I, I would I would identify um, safety critical inspections, safety critical assurance tasks, safety critical defects, and and planned maintenance on safety critical equipment as as critical backlog. However, many different operators will will define that differently. Um, perhaps with more of a focus on production. Um, you know, we 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 we've worked with a number of clients um, that are focused more on safety, and some are more focused on production. And I think this is where a documented process, you know, would help. So if, if you had a documented process, this could be defined um, to your organisations um, to to your organisation. Um, 
requirements and then that can also be tracked properly through dashboarding and, and you can have those dashboards set up so you see so it's, it's really is what is important to your company in in defining what your critical backlog is and and tracking that um, we also have Gordon Ellis on the line who who's here for some questions as well I, I don't know if you have anything to add further to that Gordon I, I think James you've you've covered it very well there the only thing I would say of course is that it's again very much focused identify the risks and focus your critical uh, maintenance uh, backlog identification on the risks that you're facing in the organization we also had a question for yourself, Tiang, and I'm conscious of, of time, but maybe maybe you could just um, quickly answer. Somebody asked, do the regulations around the world take the same approach to the operator as to how the operators are able to manage the risks of tar deferral? Um, thank you for that, Gordon. Uh, yes, um, I'm afraid that uh, globally, I think op operators has to be dealing with regulators' response, which is actually have a varying degree of approach. As I could share with you is that um, in the UK for HSE, as well as the Norwegian sector from the offshore safety regulator, PSA, they have made some very clear communication with the operators to say that the statutory requirement remains in place. However, they are looking for a proportionate as well as targeted inspection activity and maintenance activity to be continue to be prioritized onto critical areas so that deferrals of inspection and maintenance is expected uh, but they expect the adequate steps and measures will be taken to mitigate this risk which is associated to any deferral and delays however in the different geographical locations in the US I think they have made an announcement about relaxation about their enforcement on the environmental laws by the Environmental Protection Agency. Similarly, in the Brazilian National Agency of Petroleum, Natural Gas and Biofuels, ANP, they also provided guidance that they will offer relaxation and suspended certain obligations and deadlines for their administrative reportings, notifications, as well as maintenance activities. So you can see that they do have different approach. I think it's important to understand that your regulators approach and maintain an open and transparent communication to ensure that they are aware that where we are as a result of the pandemic. Thank you, Gordon. Um, okay. Again, I, I think that in, in the interest of time, if you, uh, any one of you still have any questions, uh, we will try to answer them if possible. However, again, I would like to thank you all for joining us for today. And if you have any interest or have any further questions, our contact details are on the screen. And please feel free to uh, reach out and ask us further questions. I think from us at LR, we're here to help, we're here to support you, and we know that this has been a challenging and a different time. And we wanted to share this unique experience with everyone to ensure that we actually come up stronger and managing the asset management as well as turnaround activity better in a safe manner. Thank you.